Okay, so our next talk is given by Frédéric Vachon, so please give him a warm round of applause. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm really happy to be, um, to be here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a research that a colleague uh, of mine, Jean Boutin, and I did earlier uh, this year, and which led us to the discovery of a, a UEFI rootkit. So very quickly, uh, my name is Frédéric Vachon. I'm a malware researcher at uh, ESET, and um, I've been working there for the last two years. And for uh, the last year or so, I've been really focu focusing on um, boot-level threats and uh, UEFI for more reverse engineering. So let's look at the agenda for this talk. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what is said in it very, very quickly. Then I'll talk about LoJack, which is an entity test software and uh, past research related to this uh, software. And the reason for that is that um, the UEFI rootkit that, that I'll talk about really mimics the architecture of this legitimate software. Then we'll move on and I'll talk a little bit about compromised LoJack uh, agents that were found uh, in the wild. And finally, I'll jump into uh, the UEFI rootkit, will, where uh, I'll talk about the tools around the UEFI rootkit and the UEFI rootkit itself. So, Sednet. Um, Sednet is an espionage group active since the early 2000s, and um, it is known as, also known as Fancy Bear, uh, APT28, and Strontium. So, maybe you know uh, this group by one of these alternative names. And, uh, and Sednet is the, the name basically that we use at, uh, at ESET. So uh, this group was very visible in the past uh, few years as being allegedly behind um, some pretty notorious hacks, like the hack against the Democratic National uh, Committee, the DNC, where some emails were leaked online, uh, the hack against the World Anti-Doping Agency, as well as the hack against the French broadcasting network TV5 uh, mode. But he said, when we're talking about SEDNET, we're really talking about uh, the tools and the different campaigns that were, that were led using these tools. And we're not talking about the people who are operating these, um, this malware, uh, because we don't have the information necessary to draw such conclusions. However, in July 2018, uh, the US Department of Justice uh, named the group as being responsible for the Democratic National Committee hack in this specific indictment. And what's interesting is that the tools that uh, we analyze were, uh, are named in this specific indictment, and they, um, they also mention who's, uh, who's the authors of these, um, of these malware. And also, early, um, not earlier, but closer from, from now, in October 2018, the Department of Justice issued another indictment naming pretty much the same, uh, the same people uh, related to the World Anti-Doping Agency hack. <clears throat> and the way that Sednet will usually uh, infect their targets is by sending uh, phishing emails, so sometimes they will contain malicious links and some other time um, malicious attachments. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, LoJack. So um, LoJack is an entity of software, as I mentioned, and it was previously known as Computrace, so maybe you know, uh, you know the solution by, uh, by this name instead. And it is made by uh, Absolute Software. So um, <coughs> yeah, and this solution is built in many uh, laptops. But an entity of software needs to be uh, as persistent as possible if you want it to be reliable. It needs to be uh, to, to survive an operating system reinstall or a uh, hard disk replacement. So to achieve this, what Absolute Software did is that they added a module in the um, UEFI BIOS itself. Um, yeah, and the solution needs to be activated in the BIOS setup. So with a persistence mechanism like that coming from the firmware, it really attracted the attention of security researchers who looked into this, uh, into this to find uh, vulnerabilities, basically. And at Black Hat in 2009, there was a talk there where um, the architecture of the solution was described and um, several design vulnerabilities in, in the agent were uh, also described there. <clears throat> 
So let's look at the architecture of LoJack back then. So the first thing uh, that we have here is a, a module in the UEFI uh, BIOS. And this module will write a file to Windows partition. So this file is called autocheck.exe. So it replaces the legitimate autocheck.exe, whose job is to um, perform file system integrity check during early uh, Windows boot. So by replacing this agent um, during early Windows boot, it will be executed. And from there, it will drop rpcnet uh, p.exe, which is the small agent, and will install a service. And when Windows will, will run, it will run this service. And rpcnet p will be uh, launched at this point. And it will inject uh, itself into SVCOs. And then from there, it will inject itself into Internet Explorer, which is uh, pretty interesting because it's very shady. And that's something that we see pretty much all the time in malware, but not often in legitimate uh, software. And then from Internet Explorer, it will then communicate with the command and control server, and it will download the um, full recovery uh, agent. So now let's look at um, some of the issues that um, the researchers found with this, uh, in this solution. So uh, one of the vulnerabilities they found is uh, very interesting for us. And in fact, that's really the, the only one that matters for, um, for this talk. And it is a configuration file uh, vulnerability. So the configuration is embedded into rpcnetp.exe. And it is encrypted, but it is encrypted with a, a very weak algorithm. So it is in single byte XOR key. And it is not authenticated whatsoever. And what's in this configuration file? Well, well that's where you can find the, um, the server, so the command and control uh, server. So an attacker can just change this uh, configuration to point to its own attacker control server. So we knew that this vulnerability existed for a while. So it, it was back in 2009. But we had no evidence of it being used in the wild until earlier this year when Arbor Networks published a blog post where uh, they described some modified small agent with modified configuration, where the domains that were embedded in this configuration uh, were linked to old sednets, uh, old sednet domains. So let's go back to the LoJack architecture and look at where this uh, attack took place. So it took place at this uh, level here. <coughs> so from there, we, uh, we did some detection for, for this malware. And, uh, it was, and we, we hunted to gather as much um, samples as, as we could. And it was fairly simple because they all, always modified the same exact version of the, um, of the agent. And they modified, so that's what we can see here. They modified the, um, the, 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 the command and control server. And here we see the, the, the encrypted version, of course. So by looking at, at this, we, we look at ESET telemetry and found out uh, that there was a few organizations that were hit mostly in the Balkans, in Central Europe, as well as in Eastern Europe. These were military and diplomatic organizations. And what's interesting is that we also found other uh, Sedney tools in the same organization. So at this point, we wondered how this, this malware got there. But since there was other backdoors of Sednet in the organization, we thought it might be the, the infection vector. But by digging a little bit deeper, uh, we found another interesting component. And if we go back to the LoJack architecture, uh, the component that we found is at this, uh, this step here. So at this step in the, Lo in the LoJack architecture, it's autocheck.exe that, um, that lives there. But what we found is another file called autochi.exe <laughs> instead of autocheck. And it does pretty much the same thing. So it also installs a uh, service, and it also drops rpcnetp.exe. But it is the rpcnetp version that has a modified um, server in it. So sednet uh, domain, basically. And we continue to look at what we can find in these organizations. And we, we, we found another tool, uh, which is called info.efi.exe. And that allows to, drop, uh, to, to, to dump a lot of information about very low level settings of the, uh, of the machine. And this tool uses 
read write everything's um, driver. And read write everything is a um, software that allows you to manipulate very low level setting of your machine. So using this tool, you can uh, read and write to PCI configuration register, to memory map IOs, uh, to IO port space, and you can also access physical uh, memory. And this tool uses a uh, kernel driver, of course. If you want to do th those things, you need a kernel driver. And this kernel driver is properly signed so that you can push it uh, on even a recent version of Windows. And so, yeah, that's the, the driver that was used by um, Info EFI here. And by Googling a little bit around, what we found out is that this specific driver was used in the past by security researchers to exploit vulnerabilities at the uh, firmware level. So, um, yeah, the, the last thing that was uh, missing here to mimic uh, the whole LoJack solution was a UEFI BIOS module. So, at um, this point, we wonder, did they, did they get there? So, uh, because of the, the tool dumping information about the BIOS that I just uh, spoke about, we were pretty confident that something more was happening there. And by digging a little bit deeper, we found uh, other tools that strengthen our suspicions. So the first tool is called RE Writer Read. And it is a tool used to dump the uh, content of the SPA flash uh, memory. And it also uses read write everything's driver, and it uses these specific um, I.O. control codes. So um, it, allows, it allows it to read and write to memory map I.O. space, as well as read and write to PCI configuration registers. What's interesting for us as a uh, reverse engineer is that this tool contains a lot of debug strings, so it really made our job uh, easier. And uh, it consists of the following operations. So the first thing it will do is that it will log information on the uh, BIOS control register. And we'll talk uh, in a lot of detail about this uh, register a little bit uh, later in this talk. Then it locates the BIOS region base address. And uh, finally, it reads the UEFI firmware uh, content and dump it to, uh, to a file. So another tool that we, we found is really complementary to the tool uh, to RE Writer Read, and it is called RE Writer uh, Binary. So it also contains a lot of debug strings. It also uses uh, RW Everything's driver. And now that the UEFI firmware is dumped um, into memory, the next step is to add the root key to the firmware and to write it back to the SPA flash memory, and that's exactly what this tool does. Okay, so now let's talk about the patching of the UEFI firmware. But before we dig into the subjects, there are a couple of things that I want to introduce uh, here just to make sure that we're on the same page. So the first thing I want to talk about is UEFI, and uh, UEFI stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. And it is a standardized specification that defines the interface that exists between the operating system and uh, the firmware. It is kind of a replacement for the legacy uh, bias. So a UEFI compliant firmware will provide a set of services to uh, UEFI applications. And here read uh, the operating system loader. There are other UEFI applications, but usually uh, it's the operating system uh, loader that, that runs. So uh, the first set of services is called the uh, boot services. And these are services that are available during the firmware lifetime. But once the operating system is loaded, these services are not available anymore. And there are the runtime services that are also available during firmware uh, lifetime. But once the operating, uh, lo the operating system is loaded, they are still available so that a kernel driver, for instance, can make call in these services. Um, and an example of these services allows the operating system to uh, read and write to UEFI variables. And what's interesting with UEFI is that there's no more master boot record and volume boot record in involved in the boot process, uh, meaning that there's no uh, easy way to hijack the um, early boot control flow. So the second thing I want to introduce um, here are the driver execution environment drivers, so the Dixie drivers. So Dixie drivers are PECOF images, meaning that they are basically Windows executables. And they are kind of the core of a UEFI firmware, so they, they can do many things. Some of them will be used to abstract the hardware. Some of them will be used to produce the UEFI standard interface, so the boot services and the runtime services. And um, they can also be used by firmware vendors or OEMs to extend the, the, um, the firmware by registering new services, the so-called protocols in the UEFI specification. <laughs> 
And uh, the Dexy drivers are loaded during the Dexy phase of the platform initialization. And they are loaded by the um, Dexy dispatcher that we'll also refer to as the uh, Dexy core. Um, the last thing that I want to introduce for, for now is the UEFI firmware layout. So the UEFI firmware is located in the BIOS region of the SPI flash uh, memory. And um, this region will contain multiple volume, but let's look at it at, with a little bit more uh, detail in uh, this tool here, which is UEFI tool that is an open source uh, software that allows you to manipulate UEFI firmware images. So here I loaded the typical content of ASPA flash memory dump in this tool, and let's look at what we have. So the first thing that we see here is the descriptor region. So it contains, this region contains metadata about how the, the remaining data in the SPA flash memory is laid out. The second region that we find here is the ME region, which contains the Intel management engine firmware. And finally, we have the BIOS region, which is really the main interest, uh, the main thing that we want to look at uh, today. So the BIOS region uh, contains multiple volumes. So let's look at uh, one volume in a little bit more detail. So here we have a volume of type firmware file system version 2. And this volume contains multiple files. And these files are identified by GUIs. So that's what we can see under the name column here. And a file doesn't contain directly the UEFI um, executable, but it, it, it is composed of multiple sections. And one of these sections is the actual UEFI executable. But there are other sections, and in this case, we see a Dexy dependency section that allows to define dependencies for this specific UEFI image. And uh, we also see a version section and a user interface section, which allows to give a human readable name for this file instead of the uh, GUID, which is very, pretty difficult to, um, to remember for humans. OK, so now that we have all this uh, in mind, let's go back to our eWriter binary. So what our eWriter binary will do is that it will parse all of the firmware volumes that it can find, looking for four specific files. So it looks for IP4 Dexy, NTFS Dexy, SMI Flash, and the um, Dexy core. So why does it look for IP4 Dexy in the Dexy core? Well, these files will look for uh, to find the firmware volume where to install the UEFI rootkit. So usually in UEFI firmwares, all of the Dexy drivers are in the same volume. So when the tool will parse, will find, in fact, IP4 Dexy, it will know that it is currently parsing the volume with all of the Dexy drivers in it. And it will keep it as a candidate for the UEFI rootkit installation. And it looks for the Dexy core basically for the same reason. But sometimes the, um, the Dexy core is in a different volume. So when it will find it, it will keep uh, the volume as another candidate for the UEFI rootkit installation. And um, the chosen volume will be the one with uh, enough free space available in it. Now, NTFS Dexy. So NTFS Dexy is the American Megatron Incorporated uh, NTFS driver. And if the tool finds it, it will uh, remove it. And the reason for that is that the uh, UEFI rootkit embeds its own NTFS uh, driver. So to avoid any conflict with another NTFS driver, it just removes it. And now uh, SMI flash. So SMI flash is looked for, um, and you know the tool will, if the tool finds it, it will keep some metadata about it in the structure. But in the version of the tool that we analyze, it's not used anywhere. But interestingly, SMI flash is a non-vulnerable uh, Dexy driver. So what we believe is that Sidnet might have been fiddling in another version of the tool with some exploit for this, uh, for this driver in order to be able to bypass write protection mechanisms to the um, BIOS region of the SPA flash memory. So now that it has found um, the volume where to install the rootkit, it will uh, add the rootkit, right? So the first thing it does is that it will create a firmware file system file header. Then it will happen the rootkit file, which is a compressed section that contains two other sections. One of, one of these is the actual uh, UEFI rootkit image. And the other one is, the user, is a user interface section defining the name for this rootkit, which is sec uh, dexy, as in security dexy. And then uh, it will take this blob of data and write it at the end of the firmware volume that, that was uh, chosen. So 
now the DEFI rootkit is inside the firmware into memory, the next step is to write it back to the SPA flash memory. And once again, there's a couple things that I want to introduce here. So I want to talk about bias write protection mechanisms. So the chipset exposes write protection mechanisms that need to be properly configured by uh, the firmware, so there are no such thing as, you know, um, bias write protection mechanism enabled by default. It's really the job of the firmware to do that. And uh, today we'll only cover relevant protections to our research, uh, so only the um, protection mechanisms that are looked for by, by our e-writer uh, binary. And um, yeah, the protection we'll talk about are exposed via the bias control register that we, uh, we've seen a little bit earlier in this talk. So um, if you're a kernel driver and you want to write to the bias region of the SPI flash memory, what you need to do first is you need to set the bias write enable field of the bias control register to one, and then you're able to write to, um, to the SPI flash memory. But of course, you don't want any, kern any kernel driver to be able to modify your UEFI firmware and potentially break your machine. So there's a protection mechanism there, which is another field in the bias control register. And this field is called bias lock enable. And uh, it allows to lock bias write enable to, um, to zero. And this field is readable and WLO. WLO means write lock once. And what it means is that once the firmware has set this bit, there's no other way to set it back to zero than performing a full platform reset. But um, there's a problem here, and it lies in the fact that bias lock enable uh, implementation is uh, vulnerable. So how it works is that when bias write uh, enable is set to, uh, to one, its value will actually change in the bias control register for a small amount of time. And then the, uh, the platform will is issue a system, is the system management interrupt. And the SMI handler will set bias write enable back to, uh, to zero. But uh, yeah, the firmware must implement this uh, SMI, otherwise this mechanism is totally uh, useless. But maybe you've guessed it, but what happens if we write to the SPI flash memory before the SMI handler sets bias write enable back to, uh, to zero? So there's a race condition vulnerability here. And uh, there's a paper about it, which is called uh, Speed Racer. And to exploit this, what you need to do is you need one thread that continuously set bias write enable to one, while another thread uh, tries to write uh, the data to the SPI flash memory. And according to this paper, it works on multi-core processors as well as on single-core processor with hyper-threading uh, enabled. So Intel came up with a fix for this uh, issue and was introduced in the platform controller hub family of Intel chipsets around 2008. And what they did is that they added a field in the bias control register. And this field is called SMM bias write protect disable. And uh, the, the name is a little bit misleading, but if you remove disable, that's actually what it does. And uh, if this mechanism is activated, um, there will be no other way to write to the SPI, to the bias region of the SPI flash memory than um, uh, if you don't have all of the cores of your processor running into SMM, meaning that the job of writing to the SPI flash memory is now only um, available to uh, system management mode. And once again, uh, the firmware must set this bit, otherwise, it is, uh, otherwise this mechanism is not uh, is not activated, right? OK, so let's go back to RE Writer binary. So of course, if I talk about all of these mechanisms, it's because RE Writer binary checks for them. So it will check if the platform is properly uh, configured, and it implements the exploit for um, the race condition that I just spoke about. So let's look at the writing process uh, decision tree. So the first thing that it will look for is if bias write enable is set. And if bias write enable is set there, then there's nothing stopping it from writing the UEFI uh, image. But if it is not set, then it will check, oh, is bias lock enable activated? And this, if this mechanism is not activated, then it will just flip bias write enable to one, and then it will write the UEFI image. But if it is activated, the last thing it will check for is, is SMM bias write protect um, set? And if it is not set, then it will exploit the race condition that we spoke about. And uh, if, it is not, if it is set, then the tool will just uh, fail. So the tool only works if the platform is misconfigured. 
And we spoke about SMI Flash, the vulnerable Dexy driver. Uh, so yeah, what we think is that by being able to exploit this vulnerability, they would have been able to have a tool that, that works even when, um, when the platform is properly configured. So it's, it's a very good example of, um, <clears throat> I mean, if firmware vendors would have done their job correctly here, this tool would have failed at flashing the UEFI uh, firmware. So that's a great example of how you know, uh, firmware security is. So here, let's just take uh, a step back and look at what we have. So what we have is a software implementation to flash uh, the firmware remotely post-exploitation, meaning that as an attacker, I can you know, infect my, uh, my target the way I usually do, let's say by sending a phishing email. And once I have a foothold in the machine, I can use this tool to deploy the uh, UEFI rootkit. And what we knew about in the past was hacking teams UEFI a rootkit and it needed physical access to be, uh, to be deployed. So it's so much more convenient to be able to do it remotely. And let's note here that um, there's no proof of hacking team's rootkit being used in a, an actual cyber attack. Uh, it has never been found on a, a victim's machine, or at least it was, if it had, it hasn't been publicly disclosed. So what we did at this point is that we extracted the UEFI rootkit from the tool, and we looked at ESET's UEFI scanner telemetry to see if we can find um, something. And it turns out that we found the UEFI rootkit in the SPA flash memory of a uh, victim's machine, uh, making it the first publicly known UEFI rootkit to be used in, a, um, in an actual cyber attack. OK. So now let's look at the UEFI rootkit uh, itself. So the UEFI rootkit is a Dexy driver. Uh, so it is loaded by the Dexy dispatcher every time that the machine will boot. Uh, its file name is secdexy, as we've seen earlier. And here's the uh, file grid for future reference. So let's look at the UEFI, uh, the UEFI rootkit workflow. So a UEFI firmware will go through multiple phases when it boots. The first phase is the security phase. The second one is the pre-EFI initialization phase. And then there's the driver execution environment phase. And that's where it begins to be uh, interesting for, uh, for this rootkit. So that's where the Dexy dispatcher lives. So that's when all of the Dexy drivers will be loaded. So at some point, the UEFI rootkit will be, uh, will be loaded. And what, what will happen is that the rootkit will create an event attached to EFI um, group ready to boot, and it will bind a notify function to this, uh, to this event. So in the next phase, when the boot manager will run, at some point it will, it will signal this event, and the notify function will be, uh, will be called. So the notify function does three things. The first thing is that it will install an NTFS driver. Then it will drop a touchy.exe and rpcnetp.exe um, using this NTFS driver. And finally, it will patch a value in the Windows registry. So <coughs> the NTFS driver is needed to get file-based access to Windows partition. And, um, Synet's operator did not write their own NTFS driver. What they did is that they, um, they used Hacking Team's NTFS driver from Hacking Team's leak. And um, yeah, so here's the code responsible for uh, dropping the file. So as we can see here, it is dropping rpcnetp.exe. And here it is dropping otochi.exe. And the last step is to patch the Windows registry. So how it does that is that it will open the file backing the HKLM uh, system registry hive. And it doesn't have all the logic to parse Windows registry structures. So uh, it will only look for a textual pattern. And the textual pattern it will look for is auto check, auto check star. And it will change it to auto check, auto chi uh, star. And it happens to be modifying the boot execute key. So the boot execute key is the key responsible for launching autocheck.exe during Windows early boot. So by modifying it to autochi instead of autocheck, that's autochi.exe that will be executed instead of autocheck. And um, so here, if we go back to the UEFI rootkit workflow, um, when the operating system will run, then it will, uh, it will execute autochi.exe, and autochi.exe will, will drop the small agent, the rpcnetp.exe, and so on. 
But what's interesting here is that um, it will revert back the modification in the Windows registry from auto cheat to auto check. So that as a Windows user, for instance, if I look in the Windows registry, I won't find that anything, uh, any modification uh, occurred there. So that's a pretty interesting stealth technique that is enabled by the fact that the malware is coming from, uh, from the firmware. OK, so um, the last thing that I want to uh, talk about now is uh, prevention and remediation. So what can you do if, um, in fact, what can you do to protect yourself against this kind, uh, this kind of attack? And if ever you're, you find out that you're, you have a UEFI rootkit in your machine, what, uh, what can you do? So uh, prevention. So the first thing and the most important thing, which is also uh, the most accessible thing, thankfully, is that you should keep your UEFI uh, firmware up to date to make sure that if you know, security researchers found some issues with, um, with your firmware and they, they, they disclosed it and uh, the, the firmware vendor fixed them, you want to make sure that you have the latest patches available on your, uh, on your machine. Then the second thing is that you should really enable Secure Boot. But let's note here that Secure Boot itself would not have predicted you against this uh, specific attack. And the reason for that is that Secure Boot takes the content of the SPA flash memory as its uh, root of trust, meaning that what's inside the SPA flash memory is not subject um, for validation. So what does it validate then, right? Well, Secure Boot will check what's coming from outside of the SPA flash memory, meaning the PCI option ROMs, and probably the most important thing, the operating system uh, loader. So it's really a mechanism that checks that the operating system loader hasn't been, hasn't been tempered with. So what can we do then, right? Well, what we need is a hardware root of trust. So we need to move the root of trust from the SPA flash memory to some, some piece of hardware. So it must be in a you know, one-time programmable chip that is, um, that is programmed during manufacturing time and that cannot be uh, written to ever after. An um, example of this exists. A uh, technology like Intel Boot Guard implements this. And also Apple uh, T2 security chip has a hardware root of trust. And then you kind of need to hope that your uh, firmware configures the security mechanisms uh, properly, and there's not much you can do about it if your firmware is up to date. But uh, thankfully, there are firmware security assessment tools available out there. And an example of that is uh, Intel uh, Chipsec. So with Intel Chips, which is an, an open source uh, software tool, so you can just download this, uh, this tool, put it in a USB key, boot from it, and then this tool will check for all of the security mechanisms that we spoke uh, about today. We'll check if they are properly configured, and it also checks for a bunch more, uh, bunch more stuff. And um, now also Chipsec checks if your firmware has this Lojack, uh, Lojack's rootkit. So if you want to know if your firmware properly configures uh, the security mechanism, that's really the way to go. Now about uh, remediation. So um, this slide is, is kind, of, kind of short. And the reason for that is that if you find out that you're, you have a UEFI rootkit in your, um, your SPA flash, there's not pretty much you can do. You really need to reflash your uh, UEFI firmware. And that's definitely not something that is easy to do for uh, anybody. And well, if it's not an option for you, then you kind of need to uh, get rid of your motherboard or uh, your laptop and get a new one, basically. So that's how serious this kind of attack is. Now, uh, conclusion. So um, our research shows that UEFI rootkits are not only toys for researchers uh, to play with, but they are um, real-world threats used in actual cyber attacks. So it might be something that you want to keep uh, in mind uh, when you'll be defining your uh, threat model. Also, we won't stress this enough. Uh, firmware must be built with security in mind from, uh, from the bottom up. And things are getting better because there are more and more security researchers looking into this. But um, there's still work to do. And hopefully, um, our research helped share knowledge about how to prevent and mitigate UEFI-based uh, threats.
So that is pretty much it um, for me today. So thank you for, uh, for having me. And if ever you're interested to know more details about, about this research, the white paper uh, is available at welivesecurity.com, and you can grab a copy um, there. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right, if you know the drill, we have five minutes for Q&A, so please, quick and short questions. Number one, please. How do you hear of the satellites attacking other operating systems such as macOS or Android? Um, in this case, well, that's kind of the pretty much the only one we're aware of, uh, apart from um, hacking teams UEFI rootkit, and this one only works on on Windows. So we have no, uh, we don't know about any other that, that targets uh, Linux or macOS, for instance. Please refrain from walking in front of the cameras when you're leaving. Thank you. Um, could we get microphone number two, please? Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, on your slides, you mentioned a tool, open source, for checking out the layout. What was the name of the tool? It's called UEFI Tool. <laughs> so you can nice. find it on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, the internet, please. Um, thank you. Does the root kit also work when the UEFI is in BIOS legacy mode? Um, that is a pretty good question. Uh, I think it should, but I, I, I'm not sure about it. That's a, that's a good question. I, I'd have to, to look into this um, to have a, <laughs> a, an answer I'm 100% sure about. Sorry for that. Microphone number three, please. It's you in the back. Are you? No, that's four. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so, does the UEFI, UEFI dropper still work with um, BitLocker enabled? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we test that. No, it, um, it doesn't work if uh, BitLocker is enabled. So, it doesn't wait for, the, um, the, for BitLocker to have um, decrypted all of the data. So, no, it, it doesn't work uh, if BitLocker is enabled. Number one, please. Would it be possible to, to, to work with full disk description? Would it be the same as the way that the file system is decrypted in LAN? Yeah, I'm not sure I heard all of the questions, but if it works, if there's full disk encryption? Would it be, would is it the question, right? Would it be possible to make work with full disk encryption? Uh, I think it should be because um, the LoJack uh, software, so the legitimate one, the entity test solution, um, they are able to make it work even if BitLocker is, uh, is enabled or full, full disk encryption. So yeah, it, sh it should be possible to do so. One more internet question, please. Thank you. What if a rootkit doesn't fit in the SPI flash? Is filling up the SPI flash space um, completely a valid prevention? No, I, I don't know if we could really call it a, a prevention uh, mechanism, but yeah, if there's not enough free space available on the firmware volumes, uh, the tool will just fail. Number two, please. Hi. You said that there is no a real um, possibility to secure everything, but what are your daily choices that you use like on your personal computer to be fully secured? Uh, well, <laughs> I could Let's say an, an alternative platform, in but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you have a modern Intel uh, CPU and you have Secure Boot enabled and you have you know all of the latest UEFI um, firmware updates, that's kind of the, the best you can you can do to uh, to be safe right here against that kind of I have, I attack. Have my, uh, like this number one, <laughs> please. So going back to the load uh, uh, configuration file vulnerability, uh, is the uh, configuration file on the operating system file system 
No, no, no. The, the configure. In fact, it's, it's there. It's not a separate configuration file. The configuration is embedded inside um, the the executable. So it is embedded into RPC netp.exe. Unfortunately, we are already out of time. So please thank our speaker again. Thank you.